Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. Hmm. And this particular lesson is lesson number 10 in that series for June 5 of 2021, entitled The New Covenant. Now, we've spoken about a new covenant several times already. I wonder what's new about this lesson. Well, I guess we'll find out. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow now in recognition of your lordship, your creative ability, the fact that we owe everything to you. Help us now to understand something of what these covenants have meant and what they should still mean to us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What was the big difference between the New Covenant and the Old Covenant? Is this so-called New Covenant really new? Have the conditions of acceptance by God been changed in any way? So, what's, being, what's implied by that question? These are questions from the, basically from the Bible study guide. It's sort of implying that if you don't accept the covenant, God's not going to accept you, right? Wasn't God's love demonstrated clearly all the way from the days of Adam and Eve to our day? So what parallels do you see between the Old and New Covenants? How is the law involved? Hebrews 8, 6 suggests that the New Covenant is better is a better covenant. What does that mean? Is there any relationship between the high priestly ministry of Christ, Jesus Christ and the heavenly sanctuary and his covenant of grace? So now we've got lots of questions to deal with, don't we? Notice these, these scriptures about the New Covenant. Hebrews 6. 8, verse 6. Excuse me, Hebrews 8, verse 6. But now Jesus has been given priestly work which is superior to theirs, just as the covenant which he arranged between God and his people is a better one because it is based on promises of better things. American Bible Society, 1992. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The Lord says, The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Now I'm going to interrupt for a second. Where were the people of Israel at this point in time? No one knows. They were dispersed. Scattered in the Assyrian Empire and various all over the place. There was no separate Israelite people at that point in time. So when Jeremiah said that, that was a promise of God to almost to resurrect, almost like resurrecting the dead, wasn't it? Okay, go ahead. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep my covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it in their own hearts. It will be their God. I will be there. Excuse me, I will be their God, and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord, because all will know me, from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins, and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Good news, Bible. Okay, Amen. every time I read that passage, I immediately think of something. Is there something wrong with God's memory? No. No. So how can he say, well, I forgive their sins? Well, we, we believe that God is a very forgiving God. That part I don't have so much a problem. But I will no longer remember their wrongs? Well, what, what does that mean? I'm not going to bring them up again. Hold it against them. Okay. So we, we're not going to have a chance here, but we've already talked about it in previous lessons. There are a lot of verses that say that we're going we're gonna to be talking about the plan of salvation on this earth for the rest of eternity. Can you talk about the plan of salvation without mentioning any sins? You're not going to be dwelling on the, the negative aspects of life. Okay. You're going to be expanding your understanding about the, uh, about the Creator. So. Yeah. And not only will, will we be talking about the plan of salvation forever, we'll be learning more about it, mm -hmm. which suggests that 
we have just a tiny outline of it now. Yeah. And it includes much more than just how God saves you and me. It includes the truth about God and his government and especially all the events connected with his basically defeat and, and destruction of, of God's enemies, particularly Satan. Several things should be apparent from these verses. One, God is the one who instigates the covenants. It's my covenant, I made it, da da da. Two, it is his law that is being talked about. So if God makes a covenant, is that a law? What do you think? Well, he's not gonna break it. Yeah. Learn, learn. Yeah, that you can what trust kind of, things. okay. What kind of relationship is God talking about here? Four, is it possible for God to literally put his law in our hearts? It's in our now, mind, our heart we're is not our gonna, mind. Okay, we're not talking about something that pumps through four chambers in the middle of our chest. This is um, talking about something in our mind. So what was the problem with the Old Covenant? The Old Covenant was based on the promises of the people and not the promises of God. Well, that would make a difference, wouldn't it? Definitely. <laughs> but in some aspects, you can look at that and say, God is going to put the law in them, rather than me looking at the law and going, this is what I want. This is mm -hmm. the way it should be. This is the way I want to live. So if he's putting it there, is he changing you without you changing yourself. Well, we're going to talk about how that might happen. That's part of what we ought to really focus on in this lesson. Exodus 19.8. Gordon? Then all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. That's from okay. the Jewish Bible. Now, Exodus 19.8. At what point in history did that happen? Before the giving of the even before God Sinai. came down on Mount Sinai and gave the commandments, they said, "Yeah, just tell us, God, whatever you want us to do, we'll just do it, no problem, right?" Yeah. Well, for Moses wrote it down, and what did he do? He quoted it to him. He said, "You know, this is what God said. Yeah, okay, fine. Whatever God said, we will do." Exodus twenty-four, verse three, and then he said, "I think we need to make this a little more permanent." He wrote it down, and then he read it to them. Oh, yeah, no problem, we'll just do it. And what happened? Yeah. A few days later. <laughs> the new covenant is, yeah? They weren't listening. They weren't listening to you. <laughs> kind of like kids. Yeah. Yeah. The new covenant is based on God's promises, God's promises. The old covenant failed because almost immediately the Israelites broke their promises, or their promise to God. Technically, we're not talking about a new covenant, but a rather a renewed covenant. What would that mean? What would be the difference between a new covenant and a renewed covenant? A renewed one is one that's brought to life again, re-emphasized, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to something that's well, brand but new. But basically has the same provisions and all the, pretty much all the same, isn't it? But what about this? Isn't there a contradiction in Jeremiah 31, 34? Even though, and I'm quoting now from our Bible study guide, even though the Lord says that he will write the law in our hearts and place it within us, that should solve the problem, right? He still stresses, he will, stresses that he will forgive our, our sin and iniquity, which is a violation of the law written in our hearts. So that means he either he didn't do a very good job of writing it there, or we you broke got, it. you got to put the paradigm of uh, freedom you know God's not going to force somebody to and, and put a steering wheel you, it wheel in you and steer you around you're yeah. still going to have the freedom to make your own choices and there's consequences of making those choices of course in Romans Paul suggested that our conduct tells us something about our relationship to God and his law Myra Romans 2:15. Their conduct shows that what the law commands is written in their hearts. Their consciences also show that this is true, since their thoughts sometimes accuse them and sometimes defend them. So if 
your thoughts I mean do we ever have experiences where mom says where our mind says no I, I really shouldn't do that or yeah that's what God wants me to do so that would mean that something is written at least in our mind right in this context uh, love is the fulfilling of the law mm -hmm. right isn't that what, what, what it says so <laughs> teach people how to love mm. But not everyone's conscience is reliable. That's true. There are some of us humans whose conscience is essentially non-existent, and you know, it's not it's not wrong well, to kill someone. There are some famous criminals in the past in the United States whose mother, I think of one particular one, whose mother taught him. He says, don't do this. And she basically said, you do all the evil things. And he, he became a very, unfortunately, a very successful criminal because he, he had no compunctions about anything. I mean, yeah. steal, and that's fine. That's what you're supposed to do. As it was in the days of Noah, yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, they had no conscience. Yeah. Jesus expanded that idea to a greater degree in the por por portion of the Sermon on the Mount recorded in Matthew 17, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 17 to 28. And I think that's important enough we should read at least part of it. Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. And then dropping down um, to 21, you have heard that people were told in the past, do not commit murder. Anyone who does this will be brought to trial. But now I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be brought to trial. Whoever calls his brother you good for nothing will be brought before the council, and whoever calls his brother a worthless fool will be in danger of going to the fires of hell. And uh, you go down to verse 27, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. So those are massive expansions of the law, right? Is there any hint here in either of these passages? So this, any? this is actually a bit like the 10th commandment. Yeah. You know, it's, it's in the heart. It's in the brain. Mm -hmm. where, you know, if I desire something, that's wrong, mm -hmm. as well as doing it. Well, it wouldn't be wrong to desire a good thing. Sin starts in the brain, doesn't if, it? If I desire a sin. Yeah. Well. I covet. Yeah. Is there any hint from any of these things that uh, the law has somehow, sometime, under some circumstances, been done away with? as many people would like to think. What is it that they want to get rid of? All the people who want to set the law aside, what are they trying to get rid of? They don't want, really don't want to take responsibility for anything. They just they don't want, they want Jesus, to, Jesus paid the penalty for your sins and you're all paid up and yeah. hallelujah. I heard it said within the last week one of, one of the pre persons I worked with was quoting someone else who said, oh, after you're a Christian, you don't sin anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> what does that mean? That's fantasy land. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the thing that a lot of them want to get rid of is the Sabbath. You know? They want to get re away with, with the consequences of breaking the law. Yeah. Jeremiah lived in the days when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem three times. I mean, imagine living in Jerusalem under those circumstances. And finally, completely destroyed it. But the idea he expressed in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, which we read a moment ago, were not new at that time. Hosea lived in the final days of the northern kingdom of Israel about 120 years before Jerusalem was destroyed. And what does Hosea say? Hosea 2, 18 to 20. At that time, I will make a covenant. That's what we're talking about, covenants, right? With, the, with all the wild animals and birds that they will not harm my people. Hold on. Why is he making covenants with wild animals and birds? Almost all the people are gone, right? They've already been chased off and sent off to whatever. Um, I will also remove all weapons of war from the land. All swords and bows will let my people live in peace and safety. Israel, now here's these people that are just about to disappear into, into history. We're, not, we're never going to hear from them again. And God says, Israel, 
I will make you my wife. I will be true and faithful. I will show you constant love and mercy and make you mine forever. I will keep my promise and make you mine and you will acknowledge me as Lord from the Good News Bible. Does that sound a little bit like some of the other things we've been reading? It does, doesn't it? Very close parallel between that and Jeremiah 31, which was written 120 years later. Notice the references to marriage, faithfulness and obedience, love and mercy, promises, recognition of God as Lord, etc. It is interesting to notice historically that the times when God's people were in the greatest troubles were the times when he sent the most prophets. What do you think that was? And now I have a, a trivia quest, question for you. How many prophets were alive and prophesying actively at the same time that uh, Jeremiah wrote his 30, Jeremiah 31, 31 uh, to 34 there? You know how many prophets were actively prophesying at that time? I think I remember it was eight. Seven, I think. Oh. May, may have been may have been eight, but seven that I know of right away. Yeah, that include, of course, Jeremiah himself, Daniel is there, Ezekiel was there, Huldah, and there are several others that don't didn't write things that we have, but we have them uh, written them noticed mentioned in the Bible. So, have we had a pro do we have a prophet now? Are we so good okay. that we don't need a prophet? <laughs> yeah. Or are we so bad that we're, we're beyond hope? Mm -hmm. Well, Jeremiah was prophesying from Jerusalem. Ezekiel was prophesying from Babylonia, where he was in captivity. Notice his comments and compare them with Jeremiah's. So here's two or three verses, Jim. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. The sovereign Lord said, I will give them a new heart and a new mind. I will take away their stubborn heart of stone and will give them an obedient heart. Ezekiel 18.31, the Sovereign Lord said, Give up all the evil that you have been doing and get yourselves new minds and hearts. Why do you Israelites want to die? Ezekiel 36.26, the Sovereign Lord said, I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. That's a pretty clear message three times, right? Yeah. And when we say obedient, you could say you will listen. Because mm -hmm. that's God's complaint to the Old Testament is you don't listen. Okay, so Sounds my... Sounds awful lot like Jeremiah 31 again. Yeah, doesn't it? Myra asked us some questions about some of these things back in the beginning. What needs to happen to get a new obedient heart? Is it just our choice? Or do we need to do something? Well, things don't happen in a vacuum. You've got to have some interaction. Mm -hmm. There has to be a relationship. Uh, I mean, I've spent 45 years with this man. Okay. And You're not that old. Yeah, I, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm still with him. No. <laughs> But, I mean, you have to have something. Yeah. A relationship. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Carrie, I think you got something coming up here. The Lord will provide a heart to know that I am the Lord. From Jeremiah 24, verse 7, Revised Standard Version. He will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel eleven nineteen Revised Standard Version. I'm going to interrupt you again. Is this a uh, heart doing? I mean, is God doing uh, cardiac surgery here? What's happening? Sounds a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> Go ahead. And we'll give a new heart and a new spirit. Ezekiel thirty six. 26, Revised Standard Version. He also says, I will put my spirit within you. Ezekiel 36, 27. And New American Standard Bible. This work of God is the foundation of the new covenant. So, is this the part where... Oh, I hate to say that I have been lax in my Bible study. 
mm. and my relationship with God. So is this the part where he steps in, he promises to step in and... Okay. Let's make this very clear. Only God can make these changes. And that's the role the Bible describes, the role of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who actually can make changes in our minds, in our, in our oh, quote, our hearts. So how does that happen? We have to allow it. We have to allow it. And how do we allow it? Well, let's read on. It's gonna, we're going to talk about that. If someone were to ask you how to make that change, could you give an answer? Well, one of the issues we've been talking about covenants is to understand who was involved. In the scriptures themselves, taken literally, it is always between, almost always, between the people of Israel that were involved with God. But there are, there are repeated references suggesting that God wanted to include everyone, not just Israel and Judah. Oh, from the revised, New Revised Standard Version, Isaiah 56, 6 and 7. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to them, to lo love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Okay, a house of prayer for all peoples. And so the Jews were very happy to accept that message, right? Amen. <laughs> no, yes. this is our message. This isn't for, this isn't for the Gentiles. This is for us. Mm -hmm. Paul, who was once a Pharisee of the Pharisees, was very clear that although the covenant was originally made with the children of Israel, Everyone who is willing to accept God's conditions can be considered not just a believer, a descendant of Abraham. Well, in Galatians 3, 28 and 29, Good News Bible. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are descendants. You are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Wow. There's no difference between men and women except uh, when we're talking about mi the ministry. Yeah, right. There's no difference between... Oh, I didn't say that. Did I say it? No difference at all when we talk about having babies, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Do those verses suggest that God still accepts sinners on the same basis as he did long ago? Hmm. One of the huge questions is whether the main issue is our past sins or our future behavior. Hold on. Past sins, future behavior. What's the difference here? What, what, what's going on? So many people believe, <clears throat> I used to, teach Bible, a Bible study class in a, in a private home with a number of people came and participated. And one of the young men there, owner of one of the, actually we went back and forth between a couple of homes. One of those homes, the father in that home said, he grew up in a church where he was expected to go to the service on Sunday morning and confess his sins. And he always hoped that if anything was going to happen to him, he would be run over or killed on his way home from church on Sunday morning because that was the only time that he thought he was all right with God. Yeah. So that's, a, that's what you call a, a preoccupation with what? Our past sins. Past sins, cleaning up the records. Have any of us ever been taught when we were younger that there's a record in heaven and every night you better get down on your knees and pray to God so that God will wipe away all your sins so that you have a clean slate? If there's one left, yeah, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Forgot to Forgot. ask wow. for forgiveness for that I think one. some of us have, have been taught that. Yes, for sure. So what's the alternative? What, what's the, what, what kind of 
Christians are focused on our future behavior. Why do you think Jeremiah 31, 30, 33 through 34 that we've been focusing on? Let me just read that again for us. Really quick here. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God um, and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizens to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Does it sound there like the focus is all about forgiveness of past sins? Well, it's mentioned. It's mentioned. But God talks about putting our law. So if God's putting the law in our hearts, is that going to affect our past sins or is that going to affect our future behavior? So it's not our past sins, but we need to change so that our future behavior is closer mm -hmm. to where we should be. It's not going to be perfect. Yes. Except maybe gyms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but hopefully it's better. Yeah. Okay, so let's, um, where are we? Hebrews 10, 17 and 18. Can you use that, Jim? Yes, uh, Hebrews 10, 17 and 18. And then he says, I will not remember your sins and evil deeds any longer. So when these have been forgiven, an offering to take away sins is no longer needed. Hebrews, Can go ahead. Hebrews 8, 11 and 12, 11 and, and 10 and 12. Excuse me, Hebrews 8, 10 and 12. Now this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel in the days to come, says the Lord. I will put my law, my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will forgive your sins and will no longer remember their wrongs. Good news, Bible. Do those verses sound familiar? Yeah. yeah. So, Jeremiah 31 again. Yeah, and it's also in Romans. This is repeated several times. So why is this such a big deal? Well, after the resurrection of Jesus and his return to heaven, the initial group of followers were all Jews, as far as we know. Even though Jesus had told them so, it took a while for them to recognize that they were supposed to reach out to Gentiles as well. In fact, they had to be pretty vigorous in trying to convince them to reach out to the Gentiles, didn't he? Weren't they told to go to Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria and then the ends of the world? Yes. They remembered it sometime to write it down. Yeah. But... Paul went to great lengths now to, in Romans 9 through 11 to discuss how God feels about the Jews. See especially these verses in Romans 11. Now, before we read those, I want you to think about this. Paul is a Pharisee of the Pharisees, or he was. And in, in those early days, he, I'm sure, believed that the whole, you know, the whole world in his mind were Jews. And now what's he saying? We already read his verse that said, what? Everybody, male, woman, you know, slave, free, da-da-da-da-da. Jews are Gentiles. All, you're all Jews, Gentiles, you're all descendants of Abraham. So now he says, so he's, and, and what was happening to Paul at this point in time? There were people following him around trying to reinforce these old ideas that the Jews, you know, the stuff that he used to believe back when he was young. So we, we've got a battle going on here between the former Pharisee of the Pharisees and the, the present Pharisees. Quite a, quite a situation. But Carrie, can you read those verses for us? Yes. Romans 11, verses 5 through 7 and 13 through 24. <clears throat> it is the same way now. There is a small number left of those whom God has chosen because of his grace. His choice is based on his grace, not on what they have done. For if God's choice were based on what people do, then his grace would not be real grace. What then? The people of Israel did not find what they were looking for. It was only the small group that God chose who found it. The rest grew deaf to God's call. I am speaking now to you Gentiles. As long as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I will take pride in my work. Perhaps I can make the people of my own race jealous 
and so be able to save some of them. <coughs> For when they were rejected, the human race was changed from God's enemies into his friends. What will it be then when they are accepted? It will be life for the dead. In the first piece of bread, if rather the first piece of bread is given to God, then the whole loaf is his also. And if the roots of a tree are offered to God, the branches are his also. Some of the branches of the cultivated olive tree have been broken off and a branch of a wild olive tree has been joined to it. You Gentiles are like that with wild olive tree, and now you share the strong spiritual life of the Jews. So then you must not despise those who were broken off like branches. How can you be proud? You are just a branch. You don't support the roots, the roots support you. But you will say, yes, but the branches were broken off to make room for me. That is true. They were broken off because they did not believe, while you remain in place because you do believe. But do not be proud of it. Instead, be afraid. God did not spare the Jews who are like natural branches. Do you think he will spare you? <laughs> yeah. Here we see how kind and how severe God is. He is severe towards those who have fallen, but kind to you if you continue in his kindness. But if you do not, you too will be broken off. And if the Jews abandon their unbelief, they will be put back in the place where they were, for God is able to do that. You Gentiles are like a branch of a wild olive tree that is broken off and then, contrary to nature, is joined to a cultivated olive tree. The Jews are like this cultivated tree and it will be much easier for God to join these broken off branches to their own tree again it's from the Good News Bible. Wow, <laughs> that's quite a presentation there. Yeah. And we just that read, we only read part of, of chapter 11 and he goes on from 9, 10 and 11 talking a lot about how he felt about the Jews and he had a burden for them but that obviously wasn't where he did his work. The interesting thing to notice about all this is that salvation is always by faith in God. By what? Faith. faith. Faith in God, who will forgive our sins and give us new hearts to become more like Him. Do we believe those very important words? If so, we need to understand the basic issue of faith. The key to the whole relationship with God is faith or belief, or confidence, or trust. These are all, all words that can be translated from the same uh, original Greek word in the scriptures. Based on all of scripture, a biblical definition of faith, stated so well so many times of one of God's best modern friends, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. And I would encourage you, if you uh, think this is as important as I think it is, um, Look up our, on our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can download this lesson, and there you'll have this definition for you to think about and, and contemplate. Okay. Faith is Pardon? just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. And we cannot say will be because we remember the story of Lucifer. Faith implies an attitude toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we are sure he is the one saying it. To accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it without reservation for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means that like Abraham, Job, and Moses, God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Okay, so there's the passages there if you want to look those things up and you'll see that these individuals specifically 
ask God, why, why, why? Is it all right for us to ask questions of God, or is he so sovereign and high up there, we, we, we don't even dare to, to ask any questions? We need to ask why. We need to ask why. But you have to have that relationship strong enough to ask why. Mm -hmm. Does surrendering to him in faith and obedience make us worthy? If so, how do we understand, how do we surrender to him? It means making choices every day to ignore or set aside our own preferences and instead choosing God's plan for our lives. That's not easy. How do we know what God's plan for our lives is? Look at the example of Jesus. You have to have a two-way communication with God and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I, uh, I have been listening to some materials about Ellen White's dealing with one of her former workers that caused a lot of trouble. And she would, she would deal with this person and then she would realize that this person was not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And sometimes she'd wake up in the middle of the night and she would just have this, this feeling. Um, and I want to say it just it wasn't a feeling. She could feel the presence of God. And this is a person who received we, hundreds of visions. We don't know how many. Um, she could feel God's presence. And, and God told her to do some things that she didn't think she should have done. But she did them. And it turned out to be the right thing to do. Mm. Wow. Yeah. In this lesson, there, there is considerable discussion about God's forgiveness. God is forgiveness personified. He forgave even the soldiers who are nailing him to the cross. And why are we asking questions about forgiveness? Because it's in the Bible study guide. <laughs> okay, but I hope that's not the only reason. Forgiveness isn't what we need. We need healing. Yes. We need Amen. changing. Amen. Yeah. Problem, we also, it's good for us to be forgiven too, yeah. but we really need the change. The problem is for people who are focused on our past sins, remember we talked about the difference, there's, there's two completely different ways to approach the gospel. Is it about our past sins or is it about our future behavior? If you're focused on past sins, then everything depends on what? Forgiveness. God wiped the slate clean, right? That's forgiveness. Hallelujah, I'm, I'm saved, right? That's the attitude of a lot of people. But what if God's forgiveness implies a change in behavior in the future? It has something to, oh, that, that's too much trouble. Just let me get down on my knees and ask God's forgiveness at the end of the day, and he'll clean the slate off for me, and then I can go on doing what I usually do. You could get down on your knees. Wanted to just thank God for being forgiving. Thank you for the, yeah. the way His character is, and ask Him for his assistance and guidance in the future. Yeah. Well, that's assuming you're willing to do that. Well, you're, you're not going to be on your knees if. if <laughs> well, you hope not. not. <laughs> Although there are a lot of people in the past who've gotten on their knees and climbed stairs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's true. Well, Jesus illustrates. For, God's forgiveness, I mean, imagine forgiving the people who are nailing you to the cross. Yeah. Wow. The issue is not what he is going to do about our past sins, because they are already past and a part of history that cannot be erased. God's memory is not faulty. He, he remembers perfectly well all of this. It's a part of history. God is offering us help in living better lives in the future. He's not so concerned about our past record as he is about how we will live in the future. Only legalists are concerned about their past records. Oh dear, did I say that? Out loud even. <laughs> Out loud, with a microphone right near me. <laughs> Right from the gates of the Garden of Eden, God was trying to make it very clear to humans and all beings in the whole universe that sin leads to what? Death. death. And where did I get that? Sin pays its wage death, Romans 6, 23, right? And how was that illustrated to Adam and Eve? 
Well, after the fall, it was illustrated by the death of the lambs that yeah. they sacrificed. Right there, and and, and I, I I mean I don't know how it would strike you. We're we're so unfortunately so accustomed to death that probably wouldn't strike us that much. Um, I remember that I lived in Africa for a number of years, and I don't know why it was this way, but. Every Sabbath morning, in one of the places we lived, where we, we drove a short distance to the church, and we drove past a place, and the butcher always seemed to be butchering some kind of an animal just about the time we were, we were driving by. I mean, what a way to go to church. You know, here, slash, cut, the thing would be strung up by its hind legs, and he's, yeah. wah, wah. oh, man. I mean, imagine how Adam and Eve felt when God says, now, take the... And what did he do it with? How did he kill that first lamb? With a sharp stone or what? I mean, what? We don't even know. Well, God does not need to add anything to the consequences of sin to make them worse. Death, that's serious enough. So how are things different for us in our day? While the old sanctuary system demonstrated that sin leads to death, I mean, you went there, you confessed your sins over the head of the lamb, you took the lamb's life. There it was. The life and death of Jesus answered the questions and disproved the accusations of Satan in the great controversy. That's orders of magnitude bigger than just, oh, sin leads to death. It gives us incontrovertible evidence that sin kills, while God's mercy gives life. So what are we supposed to learn from the Old Testament system of sacrifices? Well, Hebrews 10, 4 says, For the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. Good news, Bible. Hebrews 10, 11 says, Every Jewish priest performs his services every day and offers the same sacrifices many times. But these sacrifices can never take away any sins. Now hold on. Wait, wait, wait. If the sacrifices didn't take away sins, why did they do it for so long? That's a very good question. Is they there an thought that it took away sins. Well... Okay, that's the, it, what it did, we, we've already said it, it illustrated one thing. What did it illustrate? Sin leads to death. Sin leads to death. So what is the solution? You want to read us Romans, Romans 8, 3? 8, 3. What the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son who came with the nature of like a sinful human nature, to do away with sin. Okay, now if God does away with sin, does that solve the problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. So now how does that happen? What we need is, what we need is not just the forgiveness of past sins, but also the elimination of sin altogether. That will be the final solution. If sin is gone completely, the problem is solved, right? As long as it's a change in us also. Okay, well now that's the question I was going to ask next. How can you get rid of sin completely? You, the only way is to eliminate all evidence of it and all love for it. How about that, put uh, Philippians 2, 5, mm -hmm. that this mind be in you is, is in Christ Jesus? Isn't that so, how it goes? Okay, now... I hope you will, you will bear with me because I'm going to depart a little bit from what, our le what the Sabbath School Quarterly says. Um, and there's all uh, kinds of stuff about the blood of Jesus and how it, we're going to talk about that. We're going to get back to that. But I'll, let's talk about what Jesus is doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary. Do we know what that is? Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. And over in Revelation 12, we see who is called the accuser of the brethren and sisters. 
You all know Satan. that. Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters, yeah. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, may the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wealthy, wearing filthy clothes. What do the filthy clothes represent? Sins. Sins, evil deeds. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, let's go through an elaborate ceremony to get rid of these sins. Is that what he said? No. Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. If God can just deal with sin, if he can take away the clothes, then that would solve the problem, right? So he commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. So what is the context for that happening? Daniel 7, 9 and 10. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever, who would that be? God. Was, Je was Jesus living forever? Absolutely. Yes. Be careful. Wow. There was an 18 hour, or yeah, no, 20, 36 crazy. hour period of time he was not living. Okay. Okay. One who was living forever, um, I'm sorry, lost there my place are. here. Whoever sat down on one of the thrones, his clothes were white as snow and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him and millions of people stood be before him. The court began its session and the books were open. So what's happening here? The pre-advent judgment. This is a pre-advent judgment. This is the, the judgment that ultimately makes a difference for every one of us, right? So this is a time when all the heavenly universe is looking on. God is, making, is, God is reviewing the records. His government is totally and completely transparent. God has nothing to hide. And so who is learning the truth about us? The universe. The entire universe. So Seventh-day Adventist theology has stated that we are now in the time of the pre-Advent judgment. The verses above give us a good idea of what is happening. It seems that Jesus says to his attendants, take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. That does not seem to suggest some complicated high priestly action. Jesus simply deals with sin. Are you willing to accept the idea that God has dealt with sin? What, what, what does that mean? I mean, it sounds too simple, too... Mm -hmm. Just like that. What does Jesus' is ministering his... Okay, here's the, here's the quotation. These are the words that are used in our Bible study guide. What does Jesus' is ministering his blood in heaven on your behalf mean? Is this suggesting... Is this a su suggestion that it is God the Father who needs to be persuaded to accept us and let us into heaven, that is, that is that idea that somehow we or anybody needs to persuade God, oh, well, he doesn't really like us, but okay, I'll let him in. That is pure paganism. I'm sorry. The idea, what did all the pagans do? They do all these rituals, they cut themselves, they do all this, and why do they do that? To try to persuade their God to do something that they want to be done or needs to happen. Change God's mind. <laughs> Change God's mind, yeah. Okay, now, so what is God's attitude toward us? Do we need to guess? John 3.16. Jim. John 3.16, For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Good News Bible. John so who's loving the world? <clears throat> God. Okay, go ahead. John 16, verses 25 to 27. I have used figures of speech. I'm sorry, let me interrupt again. I'm sorry. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples the last night he was with them before crucifixion, okay? And this is sort of the conclusion of his arguments. He's been talking to them from John 13 through 16, and this is the, almost at the very end of 16. So go ahead. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things. But the time will come when I will no longer use figures of speech, but te will speak to you plainly about the Father. Okay, now, we need to really know about God. Jesus himself is going to speak plainly about the Father. What's he going to say? 
When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your what? behalf. I do not say? That's what it says. Some people leave the word not out, and then it <laughs> gives the wrong impression. The opposite impression. Yeah. For the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. Okay. What do we, are, are we suggesting that Jesus was wrong when he made those statements? Some have said that out, straight out. I think one Some ministers of the gospel. Somebody yeah. said, if, that's, if Jesus isn't pleading for us, all is all lost. lost. Yeah. yeah. That was, what, about 30, 40 years ago? Yeah. <clears throat> the entire onlooking universe is observing the judgment scene. They all need to see the evidence and to be convinced that it is safe to live next door to us for eternity. That is what is happening in the judgment. Kerry? Does God turn from justice in showing mercy to the sinner? No. God can never dishonor his law by suffering it to be transgressed with impunity. Under the new covenant, perfect obedience is the condition of life. If the sinner repents and confesses his sin, he will find pardon. Forgiveness is secured for him by Christ's sacrifice in his behalf. Christ has paid the demands of the law for every repentant, believing sinner. From Ellen G. White, Signs of the Times, June 28, 1905. Okay, so there's the other side of the picture, sort of, the idea that God is doing something up there that takes care of it. And yeah, Jesus has done what's taken care of it. He's told us the truth. He's he demonstrated the truth by his life and his the truth by life and his death here on this earth. So they, we have had considerable discussion regarding what it means to have God's law written in our hearts. What are the implications of that? If God's law is written in, on our hearts, it suggests that we will naturally want to obey. And here will be the final conclusion. Not right now, but the final conclusion. Gordon? From the desire of ages, all true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will. Who's doing it? God, Jesus. Yes. So conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we will be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Wow. Page 668. Okay. If every day our idea is to become more like Jesus, if we're focusing on his life, we think about what he did and try to practice that, this would be the final result. And it will be the final result for everyone who gets to heaven. When we get, we have to be like this by the time we, we get to heaven. I mean, we, the, the education will continue even in heaven. I mean, think about the thief on the cross. How much time did he have to be educated? But he will be there. The great controversy over God's character and government cannot successfully come to close until all of Satan's accusations and questions have been dealt with. We humans have broken our covenant with God many times in the past. Is it possible that we who are living so far away from the Garden of Eden at the end of this world's history could actually maintain our relationship with God? Could what Ezekiel said be still be true? Myra? Ezekiel 11, 19 and 20. I will give them a new heart and a new mind. I will take away their stubborn heart of stone and will give them an obedient heart. Then they will keep my laws and faithfully obey my commands. They will be my people, and I will be their God. Think of all the accusations that Jesus made against the Pharisees, frequently calling them hypocrites, even quoting Isaiah in, in that respect. What would he say about us? 
way back before the Sinai Covenant was first ratified, Moses had some very pointed questions to discuss with God. And we should think about these. Lord, why did you teach your people? Why do you ill teach your people? Why do you send me here? Ever since I went to the king to speak for you, he has treated you, he has treated them cruelly. And you have done nothing to help them. And then he goes on, and I don't have to read, time to read the whole thing, but God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will, I will do what's necessary. I promise to take them back to the land of Canaan, the land in which they, have, they lived as foreigners. The, my promises to I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still good. So tell the Israelites that I say to them, I am the Lord. I will rescue and I will set you free from slavery uh, to the Egyptians. And then at the conclusion, I will make you my own people. And I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord, your God, when I set you free from slavery in Egypt. So what have we learned in this lesson? We've seen there's, there's two quite different approaches to the process of salvation. Many people think that the whole issue is, how do I deal with my past sins? God says, your past sins are part of history. You can't change them, but I forgive you. That is not the problem. Past sins, if they're forgiven, the, the question is your future behavior. God says, if you will follow my will, if you have that relationship with me, that will make the difference in your life. If you think about me the next time you're tempted to sin, if you think about me and every day as, as thinking about what can I do here in, in my life today that would represent Jesus the best possible way. If we do all those things, then God will make the changes in our minds. We don't make the changes in our minds. If we allow God have, to have access to us, he will make the changes. How do we do that? We read the Bible. We think about God. And we Seventh-day Adventists, we read the writings of Ellen White, which I think are also inspired by God. And God will set us free from all the problems we face here on this earth. He will take care of it. I don't, the rest of our lesson goes on to say his blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven. I want you to think about the implications of that. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we've come here recognizing that there are many misconceptions about the whole process. This very precious and very important process that you have outlined in so much detail you will just take care of sins. You deal with our sins, Romans 8, 3. We don't have to worry about those past sins. You will take care of it. What we need to, we need to worry about is how we can come to be more like you and see our, our future behavior slowly modified until we become like you. Sin is actually hateful to us. May that be our experience, our growing experience is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.